Oh, and I've been taking jazz, so I, you know I can relate to it. It's uh, really very unrewarding for weeks and weeks and weeks, and then suddenly you'll get like an epiphany, you know, and you'll go, "Oh, I'm hearing that harmony that I." Before you, you're looking at the music and you're going, "What? What? What are they doing?" You know that kind yeah. of thing. You know. Well, I don't. I don't read music, and I can't appreciate it on that level. But I can like, like what always struck me. To, and I, I started listening to jazz with free jazz because it it connected with the punk and the noise and the death mm-hmm. metal stuff that I was listening mm-hmm. to. And um, yeah, you were into some um, atonal like cage and, yeah, like, and some of those. I you know, like take a bunch stuff. of pots and pans and roll them down the stairs. I uh, I'm still I'm still a fan. But, <laughs> but, but, but what struck Love me it. is is it's it is so completely imminent and immersive. Like you can drop into a good jazz tune anywhere you want. It's never the same song. Like I can't. Like I can listen to one of those, particularly when he had his classic quartet. I can listen to that same song a hundred times. It's never the same song yeah. because I'm listening to Garrison or I'm listening to Jones. Right, right. And as I get older, it makes more sense to me. Right. Like suddenly I'm like, you know, I was I was too young, but now I'm getting it. You know, now I got the the feel. Wow. Yeah. And it's interesting because part of the parallel with not that I'm by any means, but Coltrane was was obsessed with a character named Doc Savage. And Doc Savage was a pulp hero from the right. 30s and 40s, right. 50s, up until the late 50s, and then he stopped. And uh, I was a kid, I, I was obsessed with, with Doc Savage. And Doc Savage would get up every morning at 4 in the morning. Oh. And he would uh, exercise, and he would read, and he would do two hours of body and mind training every morning. And Coltrane did the same thing. And I did the same thing, literally. Right. That's one of the. Ri- that's what started me this whole thing. I remember as a kid. Okay, I got to do. I got to do whatever. And this obsessive in, um, focus on learning a skill and all that sort of stuff. Like you know, like you guys were talking about, like how you you know, just sort of wandered into college and right. all that sort of stuff. True. In my experience, from birth in the womb, is being an obsessive neurotic bastard. There was always. I've got to get the best to be the best at this. I have to be able to learn this. I have to be, it's like not like you were talking about playing ping pong. You know, I think I may have played three ping pong games in my life. Right. <laughs> and if I played ping pong. But if it was on the And if yes, I played ping pong, I would play 750 hours a week of ping pong until I could be. Until you could be really but, great at it. That's all I could do. Like I, when I started playing disc golf, like literally there's a towel in my office and I practice every day for hours on my form. That's what I do. <laughs> that's what I. It's like, okay. you know, okay, I gotta be able to throw 400 feet, gotta be able to, okay, I got 400 feet, I gotta be able to do this. So literally, so when you talk about this stuff, I'm crazy. Well, well you're just uh, not part right. of the slacker culture. Well, I, yeah, think it's yeah, a form, right. I think it's a form of slacker because it keeps me away from maybe some other things, you know? Yeah. There, there's, there's a, uh, there's a yeah. thing there you that, the you know. the depth. It's the breath of <laughs> yeah, it's, no, yeah, it's like, right. you know, my wife will be, like, what is it? Well, the first time we hung out, and my, my wife regrets saying this, she'll, she'll try to take it back. But when she mentioned, she goes, you know, I wish you drank. Because, you know, we could just be sitting here enjoying this. But I can tell, like we were at the, we were at, here we, go. We were at uh, Jarfly. She's sitting there, she's got a drink, and she's just hanging out. And she goes, you look so intense. And I'm like, yeah, because I'm, you know, I'm, I've been reading up on this, some, some existential constructs. And I'm thinking about how to be able, you know, like she said, but she's having a drink. She's like, dial it back, bro. And yeah, I'm, yeah. Like, I'm like, you the know. game's on, the music's playing, whatever <laughs> like, it is. It's like, I'm yeah. like, wow. Like, yeah. okay, even like when somebody posted on, uh, I'm a huge fan of this band called Wire. They're one of the first art punk bands from the 70s, and I'm obsessed with them, like everything. So somebody posted online three weeks ago their favorite post 2000 Wire songs because they reformed and they've been. And so for the last three weeks, I've been rehearsing in my mind with those 10. I keep going over and I can't be that one. So I go home and if I have any time like this more, when I go home at some point today, I'm going to listen to a couple hours of wire. I'm going to go through there. Yeah, that's a good one, but I don't know. I don't know. (laughs) But in a couple of weeks, I'm going to have my list. (laughs) All right. So one of the things I know about that type of issue Mm -hmm. is uh, there's no end. (laughs) <laughs> there, there's there's actually no goal that you reach and go, aha, whew, man, made it. No, it's the next thing that starts before the last one ends, so it's an ongoing <laughs> chain, and I'm just, you know, I'm just adding that thought to the conversation. Oh, I, I, I have a friend of mine. We went to school together, and she's a psychologist, too. 
And uh, she would say, I walk into a bookstore and I feel so overwhelmed that I'll never read those books. Right. And it, it really struck me because I walk into a bookstore and say, oh, thank God I'll never finish this. <laughs> <laughs> because what would I do if I did? You know? That's it. That, that's, that's why that's kind of you know, when I discovered Soul Seek and I could, um, I could steal any album, and you name the most obscure album ever made. And somebody on Soul Seek has it because they're all obsessive bastards. And it's like I, I found the ocean. I'm like, man, it is never. I will never drink this. It will always be present for me in some form or fashion. And so, it's well, about now, passion. are you? Are, okay, I, I'm. I'm fine with that because there's a lot of content. If we're making podcasts, I mean, we never run out. All right, so that's a good thing. And on the other hand. Okay, relaxing, being mm. comfortable, being in the moment, let it go. We talked yeah. about mindfulness. We talked about um, relaxation. You well, know, we just uh, got kind of let get off the grid, get to well, a place uh, where you're comfortable, and this moment is great. Yeah, well, well th 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 that's there's a concept of a lived moment. And again, I'm gonna obsess over the lived moment. I'm gonna I'm think about, you it about from this, every, by the way, off over a of time. every yeah. the vertices of the lived moment. And you know, like, um, like I think there is a way to to take the passion, to uh, there there is um, there is a teaching embedded in Coltrane's music about how to exist and how to be present for the breath that you have, how to be present for the moment that you have no choice to be, but to experience in some form or fashion, and you you can you can bring that to bear on things. I mean that that's not a I sure. mean it, it is when I say being driven that, that that's certainly a thing. Well, that I am, the problem I, I think I'm uh, in, is that you don't let yourself um, relax and be in that moment because something else kind of kicks back in that you've got to do. You're sort of searching, and and uh, there's always something more out there. But but, but here's the thing because I think that when you talk about the live moment, there's such a thing which which we, there's a, it's the imminent experience. And you, you guys may experience this with music, but um, I can have, uh, I, part of the reason I've never done drugs is because I don't have to. If I really listen, and I don't like, I have a music room at home. It's, it's a little bigger than this room. Uh, it's bigger than this room. Okay, and, we need to um, go to the studio then. Right there, there, is, there, there is a, and there's no, there's no there, it's just a stereo, and um, there are no chairs, because when I listen to music, I move. And so I literally can enter this sort of dervish space. And I, as I get older, it's a little harder because the next day I feel like I'm hit by a truck. But I can be in that space. If Julie goes off to visit the in-laws and takes the kid, I can be in that space for eight, nine hours, and my mind right. is blown. Like right. I am literally, I am, I am communing with God. I am, I am in that space. And so with music, with, with, the, with the reading, if um, I don't know if you've, you've probably had this experience where you've been literally floored by a sentence or a concept, sure. And when it hits you, you have this sort of this moment of expansion, and like you just sort of set the thing down and you go, "Holy cow!" And I assume that's what drugs are, because I've actually I've never drank or had a cup of coffee or done any any mind altering substance whatsoever. I'm basically Mormon, quite a without the underwear. I mean, literally without the underwear, not just the fancy underwear, but no underwear at all. But uh, okay, that's too much information. <laughs> and uh, but but I understand where you're going with that because but, I think uh, that's uh, that. Uh, all right. So first of all, thank you for revealing uh, some of the things. That I'm not wearing underwear. A lot of us have questions, <laughs> but it's not about the underwear. But a lot of, a lot of things about. Um, okay, so yeah, four o'clock in the morning, you get time to yourself. You're exploring so many things. You're constantly reading and updating things and. Um, you know the shark in the um, in the ocean that n never stops moving. But are you okay with mm -hmm. with that? Because that example you just gave was you just found that moment and you could be there for eight hours. You could just kind of immerse yourself in. Well, that, that. Our, our friends, I've mentioned before, our, our Buddhist friends, they have that that saying that if you only enjoy the meal but not the cooking of the meal, the washing of the dishes, you only have a third of a life. <clears throat> you know, you you have these moments of eminence because they also they carry over into other even the moments of the mundane, and um, so there is a way to uh, to hear a little bit of whole train playing, even standing in line, you know, to get your um, your Slim Jim in the Seven Eleven. Okay, so you're I, bringing I, it way down <laughs> now, but yeah, but I, 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 I think there is. I think there is a way to be to be present in those things. So it's not like um, like I think. Um, I may be wrong in this because I, I, I certainly can't, I don't have a bird's eye view of my own life, but I don't live for Saturday for that eight hours. I think there is a way in which I can visit these spaces 
but I carry them with me. They're not like, it's not like, um, um, like I don't, um, I think I'm pretty good at being alive. There's a famous uh, quote by, by Winnicott, uh, it's Winnicott's prayer. Dear Lord, let me be alive when I die. And I think, uh, even though there are, you know, I mean on an average week I put in a good 70 hours, there's still, I can stay alive and breathing during a good percentage of those, so, so maybe that's a, maybe that's a thing.